Perfect. Um, all right. Thanks very much, all you cool cats and kittens. It's great to be here with you. Um, thanks very much for the invite, Jens. Uh, sorry, Jens, yeah, exactly. Thanks very much for making the introduction. I've never been here. I'm actually quite impressed. You know, close to 300 people in a in a Zoom call. Uh, it's amazing. Um, and hopefully, um, what I can contribute to this discussion is exactly what Benedict mentioned. It's a bit of an outside perspective, um, a perspective that comes much more from from venture capital as well as a little bit from politics. It always feels like, you know, after you speak, after a scientist and an actual entrepreneur, it feels like, oh man, uh, at least for us, it feels like, you know, now I come here with my, my little investor talk after the people who do actually amazing stuff, but hopefully it's going to be somewhat interesting for you nonetheless. And obviously I'm very happy to take any kind of questions that you have as well. So very briefly only, because I've been giving the briefing that this is not a company presentation, I have never the intention of doing a company presentation, but just that you have a rough idea of who we are. I say we because actually I have two colleagues also, at least two colleagues in the call. Um, there's Mila, who's actually at CDTM. So she's our implant, the Project A uh, uh, campus captain, as they used to call it, Stubi Z, but actually one of our most important investment managers who is currently at CDTM, Mila Kama. There's also Nina uh, Yetta with me, who uh, works a lot with me on digital healthcare stuff. I'll, I'll paste their names and LinkedIn profiles in the chat later so you can reach to us or all three of us. What are we? The company that I founded in 2011 is called Project A. It's a venture capital fund, now close to half a billion uh, dollars assets under management. We do your typical investments, seed, series A, series B. Our smallest ticket size probably is like half a million. We can go up to 15 million euros per startup. We do B2B and B2C. So forget everything that you heard about us from the old rocket times. Don't think e-commerce, um, uh, don't think incubation. We're a pure venture capital investor. We like really deep tech stuff, um, all kinds of startups, B2B and B2C. Uh, and if you're building a company, we definitely would like to chat. But also what's unique about Project Day is that we have 100 people on payroll. Your average venture capital fund is basically five old white dudes sitting in corner offices and, and spreading money. And we put our management fee uh, to work in a different way. We have a team of 100 people that are available for you as an entrepreneur if you want them. If you don't want them, that's fine. It's just like a, a buffet menu. You pick whatever you want, and, um, and that is totally fine. Yeah? So it's just a pure optionality, something that we would like to bring to the ecosystem. Now, obviously, maybe we, let's start on a positive note, right? So we've, we've been given a bit of background and um, not everything is horrible in the venture capital world. Just a couple of examples, how we felt a very positive momentum are two companies that uh, fall pretty much into the realm that Nina and I work on, which is digital healthcare. Um, so we've been doing that for a few years now and quite interesting, actually, it always was, was fine, but oftentimes also a bit slow. Now, of course, with COVID happening, with the lockdown happening, with somehow uh, um, innovation also coming by force into the field of medicine. Our portfolio companies in the digital healthcare space uh, exploded basically in terms of usage. Cru is also available in Germany. I think in Munich there's Teleclinic. I, I think relatively similar companies um, um, are obviously benefiting a lot from that. So you could see, you know, if you just look at this, oh yeah, you know, maybe actually for innovation and so on, especially if you're in the healthcare, everything looks fine. But let's look a bit deeper. Let's dive a bit deeper into what our perspective as a VC and, uh, and basically also associate with that, what we think the politics should do um, in order to combat that, um, uh, that disease and its effects it will have on all of us. First of all, if you look through Twitter, LinkedIn, wherever, and I myself, not an excuse actually, as I'm not an exception, every VC fund will claim that they're open for business. Yeah? So first of all, on, on a PR level, you'll probably hear everyone is still doing deals. Yeah, yeah absolutely. We're fully remote. We have, um, we have been working remotely since the late 80s, um, so it's not a problem for us at all. Um, just uh, send us an email and we'll look, at your, we'll look at your pitch and so on. And um, I mean, I can speak for us. We definitely try. We work hard on basically maintaining um, everything as usual. We just signed another term sheet just today, actually, while uh, Michael was speaking, we signed a term sheet for a company whom we have never met before um, in real life, in a country that I've never been in my life. Um, so it's quite interesting. And, you know, either we will go down in history as geniuses or as complete idiots because we tried that. But um, 
that's the nature of being a venture capitalist. So of course we're trying to keep the business open, but I think for you as an entrepreneur, um, the overall guideline should be investing activity probably is going down. So expect activity to really drop. And why is that? Um, because you might argue, oh yeah, but all the funds we just, they, you know, all the funds just raised money, so they just uh, went through the phase of getting money for their funds. Now the funds are closed. There's a lot of dry powder lying around, and that is true. But at the same time, everybody in the venture capital world is just very, very, very about signaling signals of all sorts. Um, as you know, all VC-backed businesses, or the vast majority, are not profitable. So everybody's relying on funding. And our main bet when we invest in a company is, of course, if this company is taking money from me now, what is going to happen in 18 months, in 24 months? How is the situation going to be? Because if we are, for example, putting in 2 million euro in a fantastic CDTM startup that is doing something amazing, our main question would be, if we give them 2 million, what is the situation going to be like in 24 months or so? Is there going to be an ecosystem that can basically absorb this company together with us, potentially follow on fund, or we have to think we need to finance it a little bit more still. So the whole VC game becomes uh, about kind of, um, it becomes very subjective. It becomes very, um, um, what we everybody, it becomes about what everybody is projecting the future to be, which is very different from what's actually happening potentially. Yeah? So it is really uh, an industry that's happening in the minds of maybe 2000 people in Europe and what their common wisdom is going to be. Spoiler alert, the common wisdom sometimes is pretty stupid. Um, and even if we know from history that next, actually now might be the time for all of us to make good investments because valuations are coming a bit, uh, uh, bit, coming a bit down and uh, Sequoia Capital quoted the famous uh, Brazilian Formula One driver, Ayrton Senna, who said like, you can't overtake 15 other cars when the sun is shining, but you can't overtake 15 other cars when it's raining which I think is a great quote. I'm not really sure if they took into account that this guy also died while racing his car. Um, but I guess that's a different question. So all this to say, even though it might be a good, very good idea to really double down investing now and doing a lot of good deals, it is a bit of herd um, thinking, uh, not, to be confu not to be confused with herd immunity, that is definitely ruling this, um, this VC ecosystem. Um, a couple of observations. Um, first of all, of course, COVID is going to be an existential threat to a lot of startups. Why is that? Because startups are not profitable. Typically, they're not bootstrapped. Typically, they are relying on external funding sources. And if the overall economic outlook, combined with basically what we just said around uh, about the VC uh, behavior, um, it is hitting, then I think we do have a lot of companies that are in potential trouble. At, at the German Startup Association, we did a survey and basically 80% of startups are, fear, are, are living in fear of going out of business because, basically because of this crisis. Um, the number two point here on the slide kind of illustrates your actual effects in your startup, they can be very different. Yeah, um, we like to use a framework that uh, you know, we didn't invent, but other people uh, had it in mind probably. Um, it's about cyclical versus structural differences. So cyclically, basically, almost everyone is affected at the moment, maybe with the exceptions of digital healthcare and a few other ones who are actually benefiting from that situation. But cyclically, if for example, we have portfolio companies that are in, in, the, in industrial robotics, yeah? um, or we invested in uh, uh, one of your professor startups that is an automotive. Um, so those companies, they're probably not directly affected by, uh, by COVID, that being said, just because everything is slowing down, because no travel is possible, because no face-to-face -face meetings are possible, they're probably slowing down. We call this cyclically affected, right? So um, it is to be assumed that when, when the situation is over, they can recover again and things will be fine. Structurally, um, it's a different question for a few companies. If you're in travel, you probably have to answer the question, will travel ever be, will travel ever be, will travel ever be back after the crisis? As we had it uh, in, my, as we as we know it from before, maybe the answer is yeah, it's just going to be the same. Then no problem. But at least there's a chance that you're structurally affected, and your business model might actually be uh, in danger. So definitely, um, we look at our companies, and companies should look at themselves from those two perspectives. We see on the positive side, blockers for innovation are being removed the hard way. The digital healthcare is only one example. Um, we, especially our industrial startups, so companies, you know, that are 
from the area of Munich and so on, not you know your usual um, e-commerce brand from Berlin, but actual you know more um, more e-commerce related stuff. Um, that is um, quite interesting because they sometimes report that you know the people who um, who have been like the traditional blockers of us speaking to them now they're in they're uh, they're in Kurzarbeit, so they don't work for the company at the moment anymore. And only the people are left who really take decisions, and sometimes they actually um, see see benefits from that. Um, so what do we think should politics do? And uh, I don't know if some of you have been following, there's also a bit of a public debate about how politics should engage with, with, uh, um, with the startup world now. Um, so the German Startup Association has been a strong advocate for the government. If, if they want to do something for Lufthansa, for TUI, and for all those big companies that are basically almost going bankrupt, they also should think about startups. I think the public discussion has been a bit derailed um, because the whole message was shortened to there's startup millionaires who want more money from the state. What we think is the right way is to think about the government should work together with private initiative. If there is private initiative, if a private investor says, yes, I want to invest in that company, the, the state should, and that's the idea of this matching fund, co-invest alongside him under the same terms which basically means that if I want a million from the state, I also have to invest a million of my own money. And actually it's not me getting this money, it's the startup getting that money. Me as an investor, I don't gain anything from it. In fact, actually I'm, go, uh, I'm going to uh, dilute by that money. And if I make money with my one million, the state also makes money with, with the million. And together we save jobs and together we are able to extend the runway of startups so that they can, you know, suddenly they can think about 24 to 36 months and not 12 to 18, which makes a big difference in, an, um, in like an uncertain environment like this. So that's how we think the government support should work. Um, whatever you read, sometimes in the press, I think the story gets a bit too shortened. I actually think that if you require a private investor to put 1 million and then the state is matching by a million, for example, that is much fairer then, uh, you know, a KV uh, credit line uh, of which the state guarantees 80%. I also think that's interesting because this is basically the way into the Zukunftsfonds, another big project that we're working on. <laughs> we think that Germany should have a big, big fund. Um, it's also already politically approved, essentially. The talk is about a 10 billion euro fund that will be a limited partner, so an investor in funds, so that funds can invest more into startups. And um, this is not meant as a pure, you know, we need a handout from the government. This is meant also because I think there are so many great startups now um, uh, here in Germany that also the state has helped to build up through great universities um, like yours, um, through great pr uh, programs like, for example, HTGF, Coparion, um, Exist, Stipends, and all that kind of stuff. And now I think it's also time for the, um, uh, for the ecosystem or for the state actually to benefit from those companies because Funds like us, um, at the moment, if we close a new fund, we mostly deal with international investors now. So pension funds from the US, pension funds from the Nordics, from uh, the Netherlands, and so on. And we actually think it would be better to also have German money in those funds, because the, the return that we generate on this money is quite good. And I think it would be good if there is a bit of a closed ecosystem that we generate value in crisis or after crisis in this ecosystem, in, in startups, um, digitalization, globalization is not great for everyone. Yeah? So there's also people who are not benefiting from this, like all of us in this call. What can we do for them? And I think one good way would be if uh, there is public investment to fuel some of the gains that we create in this industry, to fuel them back into the education system and the social system. I think that's the best way to make sure that globalization, digitalization doesn't become only beneficial for the elites, but how we can actually give back. And this is the idea basically behind, at least my idea about the Zukunftsfonds that is announced already, 10 billion euro. And I, I would see the actual boosting mechanisms that we have uh, in mind now as, a ba as basically a way into that. And that's basically my, my, my rough perspective on the European VC landscape. Ha very happy um, uh, to discuss some more with that. But I want to end with, um, with three recommendations. Um, you know, you, you, you can... On the internet, you'll find so much uh, advice by, by venture capitalists for startups. My favorite one was this Indian guru who just says, like, don't die. 
just live for three years, do not die. Okay, thanks. Very helpful. Uh, but at the essence, that is what most, uh, most of this advice is. So the first thing, so I, I want to go a bit beyond, yeah, don't die, prepare yourself for a crisis, uh, uh, take more money, cut costs and so on. I think we all agree on that. Yeah, um, I think it's good to have flexibility. But the question then, of course, becomes runway versus flexibility. So I have the first companies in the portfolio now who uh, took decisive action right when the crisis hit. It was quite impressive to see. I guess in the portfolio, I take care of 10 companies. Basically, everybody had a cost-cutting plan in place after 24 hours. You know, so everybody acted pretty swiftly. People typically do not regret taking deci decisive action. Right? So I guess that's, um, that's one of the key takeaways. But now, for a few companies, actually, the you know the decline in business is not as strong as they would have thought so it becomes a bit of a question okay we have in, uh, extended runway which means like we have saved cash to be able to run longer but how do we balance that versus flexibility for restarting aggressively when the situation allows um because that's that's kind of the balance and the best companies we have at the moment are pretty engaged with their boards on specific that question how do we balance how do you think in scenarios what can we do from, from switching from one mode to another? Um, because I think the crisis is structurally not as, as bad for the startups that they can't think about using it or at least restarting themselves when the economy also restarts. The second thing, I think Michael um, um, just gave awesome overview. Whatever you do, I think you're going to be decisive but humane because people will remember how you act. Um, so one of my companies, um, the situation in Copenhagen, they spent a lot of time thinking and supporting the people they had to let go uh, during this crisis. And I think from a board perspective, we could say like, okay, guys, this is maybe a bit too much uh, overblown. You, you know, you gotta figure, you gotta focus on the actual business as opposed to thinking so much about those people. But I think actually they did the right thing because people will remember, maybe some of those people you will have to rehire, but most importantly, you're building also a brand about how you treat people in those situations. Um, and also even investors will, will realize, you know, they will understand, okay, if the, say, if the sea gets rough, this is a person I can rely on. So um, pretty impressive actually. And then thirdly, don't give up on fundraising. You know, even nuclear winter is coming. Um, I think it could make sense to, obviously make sense to really build on existing relationships. Um, even more so now in the situation, we always recommend people um, uh, you know, not never send us a cold email, always get an introduction to us. It will be possible. If you are um, aspiring to build a multi-million business, you will be able to get an introduction to us. Basically, that's kind of like the first test almost. Um, so specifically focus on that. Work hard on your Zoom performance. I don't mean the latest Tiger King virtual background. I don't mean the snap camera, which then is hard to disable. I mean, actually training on how do you present, how do you come across on Zoom performance. For example, I'm now looking here, but I probably should be looking here. First big mistake, yeah? So those are the kind of things that you should definitely work on. And then if you think back to structural or cyclical issues, obviously also a no-brainer, really think about could you be a crisis winner? You know, how can you tell a story about you actually being one of the companies that will come out of this even stronger that they went into? And that's pretty much it. That's my short overview. Hopefully that was somewhat helpful. Um, and I'm very happy to take some questions now. And then I think we'll meet also a bit later in um, the secret uh, room, if you want. Thank you so much, um, Uwe. Uh, great insi uh, um, insights, uh, super interesting. And I think also our audience has uh, some very uh, particular questions for you. Um, so I'll just start right in with Patrick. Um, what are your thoughts on founding a company during these times? Uh, what are risks and opportunities in your opinion? So, I mean, uh, thanks for that question. I guess the, the, the quick answer is it's always a bad idea to start a company. If you just look at the statistics, right? If you look at the failure statistics, it's always uh, a bad idea, but turning that around, I think it's always a great idea. Um, so if you, if, if, if you have an idea, if you have the right team in place, if you feel the constellation is good, and especially probably if you have a way of bootstrapping the company or access to initial capital, um, then I think now might be a good idea just as, as, as any other time. In fact, especially if you are a company that, that needs a, a technology development, for example, and you, know, you need to uh, be basically in your garage anyway for 12 months, 18 months or whatever, why not start it now? If you have access to the funding, I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a, 
a special bad time now. Might as well start. The, the whole startup, so humans are very bad at timing markets, right? I mean, that's the one thing that we know from uh, also from public market research. Nobody has any clue where in, in which phase we are at the moment. And it's a seven to 10 year journey anyway. So it probably is not that important when exactly you start. Nice, thanks. Um, I'll just go right for the next one so we can have a couple right. more. Uh, this one is from Max uh, Ventec VC, so um, in, industry, in, 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 uh, an industry expert. Uh, what do you think could be, emer um, could be emerging sectors that have previously been overlooked uh, or have been in an early stage and now are getting sustainable tailwinds due to the crisis? Yeah, so I mean, there's, I guess there's a list of obvious stuff, you know, like telemedicine, remote work, e-gaming, some entertainment things and so on. I don't know if there is like, you know, the super secret one that nobody has figured out. Um, unfortunately, the market has become too efficient for that. Um, I specifically like actually, actually the, the space that Michael is in, we also have some investments in, which is building resilient supply chains, which I guess is not as obvious. I mean, still pretty obvious, but that's one um, that I think is very interesting. Um, beyond that, I'm afraid there are no super cool arbitrage opportunities, um, but uh, just the aforementioned ones. Nice. And here another uh, particular one. So what's your opinion on early stage and pre-seed funding at the moment? Should VCs and angels get founders, uh, get a personal touch on founders by inviting them to a bunch of Zoom meetings? Or yeah. um, what's your best practices? How do you handle it maybe at Project A? Yeah, so I mean, we changed our process a bit because we just in, introduced like another step, which is like a, a longer uh, Zoom session with um, with two partners when the team has, when we all have together done already um, a bit of due diligence. Um, so this is basically not in the getting to know you stage, but basically shortly before the actual management presentation. And the discussions can actually be of high quality just because a lot of work already has been done. Um, and uh, that's something that we, we wouldn't have done typically um, if we were able to meet people offline. And so far, that works quite well for us. Um, so yeah, we are just basically just dialing up the cadence of Zoom meetings, if you will. Um, so far, we haven't figured out like a much better, uh, much better approach. Um, and I would really recommend uh, practicing that. Like, how exactly um, does it work with, um, with, with Zoom? I think especially the handover points between the team um, and so that we can understand the team dynamic a bit obviously needs to be practiced. Um, and if you can avoid the overall awkwardness of Zooms where you know, people are dialing in and then people are late and then, oh, so where are you? Oh yeah, so great weather there and great weather here. So I think if you're able just to, to bring across positive energy also in a room and um, that still works somehow. Yeah, it's still we find those people that are like, I don't really know what they do. I don't really understand the market, but some other person is great. And that's a good starting point because we can do research on the market, we can do research on the product, but it's hard to really correct the first impression. Nice, thanks for that. Uh, another question here, we are talking a lot about corporations and startups. Um, so here, what's your opinion on increasing investment activities to save the German Mittelstand? And here it's mentioned from Claudia, uh, despite the governmental uh, activities that you, you were mentioning or that are currently running. Yeah. Um, so I, I think it's a, yeah, I think it's important. I think the the German Mittelstand, um, it, you know, is super important for us. I also still have everybody has, still has the naive uh, idea of. German startups plus well, like European startups plus German Mittelstand equals the amazing combination. You know, we have entrepreneurial spirit plus the great innovativeness of Mittelstand, and that should yield massive steps for the German economy. It has never really worked so far, um, one has to say. Yeah? So it never has been the, um, the great breakthrough that we had hoped for. So um, I would love, obviously, for Mittelstand companies also to survive. Um, I think, uh, you know, the kind of big credit program is a good one for them. Um, hopefully, if they survive, they can work some together some more with the startups and hopefully, finally, we'll be able to, you know, unleash the potential that, that lies in that. Um, maybe the crisis will help there. Nice. Um, another question was, um, how, how realistic is your proposed uh, governmental initiative and uh, where do you think uh, does it stand at the moment? 
I think it's pretty realistic and I expect something to happen in the next seven to 10 days, max. Um, oh, crazy. Okay. I mean, I mean, but also one has to say, you know, this was not like nobody had a clue and then we came up and we gave a concept and then people were saying like, oh yeah, this looks pretty good, let's execute it. I mean, it is obviously also in line with, um, with what, what you know what what was being discussed um, there the people at the at the ministries for example for economy and for finance which is ministerium and uh, finance uh, finance ministerium they're very very good and they're very very smart and they're super hard working i mean that also has to be said you know um, when you walk in for your first time and you think like okay there's some people that you have to uh, explain something about startups that's not the case there's some really really good and smart people obviously you know they had great ideas and we love the exchange with them and, and we work together with them but we can't claim that we had this idea we gave it to them and now suddenly out of our you know uh, uh, pdf document they created you know uh, this by themselves um, um i've actually one, one follow-up question on that i find it super fascinating like i'm um, just wondering how like personal like this is benedict asking but i whom are you getting in contact when you propose these initiatives is it you like what, what's your initial point of contact if you go to the government uh, which contacts do you use like what's your approach there um i mean the german startup association has good has very good contacts i mean you know for, for a few years they've the, the association has been building up uh, those contacts. There are people working at the German Startup Association full time whose job that is basically to maintain those contacts, um, both with other associations um, as well as with politics. Um, whether it is people in the executive branch, whether it's people in the legislative branch, um, that's that's their job uh, to maintain those discussions. And then you know, and Christian Nieder, of course, has been you know has been doing a lot of work and. I'm just basically like a, a minion, essentially, who comes in from time to time and, and joins a few meetings. And we're all on WhatsApp all the time discussing and, uh, and, and modifying and uh, yeah, uh, yeah, discussing essentially what we want to propose. Um, but in general, that you know, the contacts are um, on the state secretary level, in the departments, in the ministries who are responsible for that stuff. There are people who work on exactly those topics and they have pretty good ideas. Nice. Thanks. Um, and I think here we go for a last question. Then the rest you guys just take with you. Uh, it's great to see so many questions again um, from, from Johannes. You, you mentioned initial funding. Um, what's your one advice to raise initial funding during these times? Um, yeah. Um, hard, there is no, unfortunately, there is no silver bullets. I mean, we all heard about the three F, friends, family and fools. You know, that's, that's always uh, a good idea. If probably even better if you don't really need external capital but you can bootstrap somehow um, if you you know can provide service to someone if you can charge implementation fees if you can, can get upfront payment from from customers um, and basically hacking together your funding I think that's probably um, what I would try to do at the moment mostly um, and uh, yeah beyond that I think the, the other the remaining funding system still is there business angels VC firms and so on I guess on the earlier stage, it's probably still easier to get some funding, um, especially if you have existing relationships, especially if they're basically uh, investing mostly in you as a person. Um, and um, that's, I would just try it. And the more you can hack your way out of actually needing uh, funding, like for example, as I said, to, you know, charging upfront agency stuff and so on, I think the better.